good to, I can't see you, but it's good to be back and good to know you're there. And welcome, Sandy. Welcome back. Great to, to be conversations. here. Hi, everybody. This is a pop up because Sandy and I were talking on our own about the, the Republican National Convention, having a lot of strong reactions to it. And we wanted to work that out with you guys and um, hear what you've been thinking. So, um, Sandy, what, what's your reaction to the Rep Republican National Convention? You came up with the title of today's talk, which was <laughs> FFS America. For fuck's sake, America, <laughs> get it together. So, I mean, part of, it, part of this is, you know, well, what's going on and um, what's, what are we observing as kind of junkies of the American political scene. But then there's another aspect, which is how does Canada look at this? Like, if this yeah. were happening- Upstairs, upstairs from upstairs, America. Uh, the upstairs neighbors of, of America. And um, what would we think of the, of the um, melee that's going on down in the apartment below? Um, and, I think and, some people have likened it to a uh, crack house or... Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the meth lab that's downstairs. Harsh. Pretty hard. Um, so, I mean, so we can get into that because I think there's a really interesting topic. Like, what would Canadian... If this, were, if this election were happening in Canada, what would we, what would we think? Oh um, and I then... Can't imagine. Well, it just wouldn't... It, it, I don't think Donald Trump could get elected dog catcher outside one or two provinces in Canada with this kind of performance. But what was really interesting to me was the dynamic. Last week, as the DNC convention was rolling out, and of course all of this was, was really uh, <clears throat> a very, very different convention because we don't have the big live audience and everybody's watching. And I think everybody was like, really, really encouraged and really liked what they saw of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and, and felt very reassured because the polling numbers um, have been good. They've started to tighten a little bit, which I think gets everybody's hair on fire, but it's important to realize like how little they're tightening and how far they have to go, even within the margin of error. But we can more on that later. Um, and, and uh, so I think a lot of people came away from the DNC convention feeling like, well, this is really, really good. You know, how are the Republicans going to answer this? Well, and they showed us how they were going to answer this with um, what I think alarmed a lot of people early in the week and still alarms um, and, and still alarms me because of how lawless it all is. Um, yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that this convention signaled, as if we haven't seen it before, is that um, Trump has now entirely and completely detached himself from the rule of law. And he's got an attorney general who is going to be his um, accomplice, who is going to aid him and abet him in that. And if he is reelected, uh, we're going to see some, we're going to see an America that that no one has ever seen in history. So I think that's alarming people enormously. On the comforting side, Trump is really boring. You know, for all of the, we're doing this from the White House and everybody is losing their lunches over the use of the White House and the use of the National Wall, Mall and the Washington Monument and there's the Trump name Trump 2020 in fireworks above the Washington um, Monument and all of that is just so um, repugnant but the main show has always been Donald Trump and he was boring and lifeless and went on and on and on in a speech that I think everybody has seen before. So well, I think that you know what was fascinating about last night was as you say, the lawlessness of it, the absolute irregularity of having a political event like that, of that stature at the White House, mm -hmm. uh, the renaming of the White House, the People's House, you might call it the People's Palace, that probably would have been a little bit better, more apt. And um, Donald Trump wasn't ad-libbing last night. He was very much reading from the teleprompter. Mm -hmm. So they clearly decided that this was the moment for him to, you know, not, not free form, 
-hmm. And I think that's why he was boring because- He's always boring on the teleprompter. He's always boring on the teleprompter. What's interesting and mesmerizing about Donald Trump is when he just has, you know, he has yeah. at it and you cannot yeah. believe the things that he yeah. says. Yeah. So that, that was amazing. But, you know, we had already been through, this was night three? Four. I got, no, this was no. night four and yeah. I watched most of it. And, um, you know, it was quite the journey from the first night to last night. And along the way, we saw a lot of people that seemed very unhinged to me. We saw a level of um, kind of religiosity, like, you know, really embracing Christian mm -hmm. um, fundamentalist rhetoric. You know, we heard people praying in Jesus' name. This is the, the whole, evangelical festival. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the whole idea of division between church and state was just crash down at this convention. And I was noticing that the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013 did break that down some by allowing in the public forum mm -hmm. more, um, more mention of different particular religions, mm -hmm. you know, breakdown in secularity. But I was still shocked by how much of that was in this convention, how totally blatant it was, and how to me as a dual citizen and some, you know, somebody who spent most of their life in America, in the South even, you know, that that breakdown of, of, of church and state was just stunning and a new America. Well, is it a new America? I mean, in a lot of ways, Ronald Reagan opened the door to all of to all of this. There, there's almost like a shift in the pre-Reagan Republican Party and the post-Reagan. And that's when we started to get God entering the picture in, a, in this kind of way. But this is, this is the most overt, you know, the, the um, uh, Franklin Graham prayer, the Catholic um, uh, homilies, the nun speaking and bringing all of this and very much a play to the that evangelical base um unquestionably and i think for any americans watching once again to take us back to how canadians view this this would be this is just this would be so offensive to Canadian voters to see any of this, wouldn't you say, Linda? I mean, this is just... I, I think totally, Sandy, but, you know, don't you think also, like I was just looking at the stats this morning, and 26% of Americans list themselves as unaffiliated yeah. to any religion, yeah. right? And 2% yeah. um, of Americans are Jewish. That's really yeah. small. And mm -hmm. it's true that the vast majority of the rest of America is Christian. You know, the numbers of Buddhists and, and Muslims are, are underneath the mm -hmm. numbers of, of Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but to, you know, America has always been a place in my mind where you're supposed to be able to, it's this melting pot where you can come and be comfortable you know, that this well, is a country for it's, everybody. Not it's a foundational just, constitutional value, freedom of religion. And yes. um, that includes freedom, freedom from religion. Um, but this uh, grasping of all the instruments of state power by in particular the evangelical um, community, this is not, uh, the Catholics I think are there for the abortion issue. Um, but largely the Catholic faith does uh, observe that separation. Certainly, I think um, Pope Francis would. Uh, this is an evangelical play, and this is, uh, this is part of the Southern strategy, I, I think. And remember, I mean, what all the commentators have been saying, and, we're, and I don't know that we're adding too much to the conversation to be repeating this kind of line, but this was really about get getting the base out, not expanding the tent. And, and, but one of the things that I feel that Trump failed to do was to, uh, what they, what the, and they're running out of runway on this particular issue is pinning something negative on Biden. I mean, this whole business about Biden's a radical and he's a Mark, you know, he's gonna go, he's gonna take America into Marxism and this is all, this is not sticking. 
none of the nothing that they have tried before not the hunter biden ukraine business um and not anything that they came out with last night i don't think is going to move those independent voters and i was just listening to something to a podcast uh, this morning i can't remember now but apparently there are more in more registered independents in the united states than registered republicans and those mm -hmm. independents are tending to break for the democrats mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know i the, i think one thing that both i heard at both con conventions was this is a pivotal moment there's never been an election that's been more important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's truth in that and not truth in that. I'm sure people at every juncture have felt like this is the most important election or, you know, mm -hmm. everything's on the line. However, uh, this is the seriousness of this election, which you were laying out when we first started, is the utter lawlessness. And you and I were talking about this before a couple of days ago not only lawlessness but actually a criminal yeah you know criminality in the white house yeah and um overt. i just wonder overt, overt. criminality mm -hmm. overt criminality and and, and I, I i don't know if you saw this too or you thought this went on too sandy and everybody but uh you know the the symbols just the symbol of like the American flat flag rolled down as like a banner between these two massive columns behind people mm -hmm. and people speaking in front of 41 American flags with golden eagles on top of them. Mm -hmm. Some of these symbols really to me had echoes of fascism in them. It, it, am I being like, am I reading too much into that, Sandy? Not, Did you see that? Not at all. In fact, actually, the night that Melania spoke, mm -hmm. all of these nights are all a blur now. I think that was two nights ago. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The when when uh, Trump was did the naturalization ceremony and the citizenship ceremony, and one of the mm -hmm. most striking visuals to me was having the two Marines open up the. Um, uh, sliding doors, which absolutely mirrored uh, visuals that we've seen all over the place of Putin entering the golden doors in, in the Kremlin. Um, if you mm. just Google Putin and the golden doors and then look at Trump entering with those Marines pulling back the doors, these images and Melania in what was effectively some kind of military garb for her talk it was it, it was it was absolutely chilling um and it was extreme it was extremely alarming and but once again i think that uh it was an incredible show but it didn't have the big ratings again the democrats with their doing it from everybody's homes got bigger ratings not only did the dnc get bigger ratings this year but donald trump's television ratings fell by 10 million viewers from his 2016 um, uh, RNC address. So I don't think that this is having that kind of impact. And there's one other difference that I think is really significant from say, you know, all of us um, are sensitive to the imagery, the mirrors and echoes of Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, Soviet Russia, etc. But America is just so much more heterogeneous than Nazi Germany was. There, there just isn't that singular cultural glue that can hold everyone together. I think that, that uh, uh, and, and we know that the popular vote is most likely going to go to Biden. All of this comes down to about 25 counties in less than half a dozen swing states. This is about swing voters in swing states. And so I'm, I'm looking at, well, what are the polls saying about those swing states? Um, and somebody that I find that I really like to follow on Twitter is uh, Dave Wasserman from Cook Political Report, and he is at Redistrict. And he has broken this down because they are polling and they are following very, very closely the house races in all the districts um, in the US. And he says that he feels like 
they are seeing there the kind of moves earlier than what are showing up on the national polls. And he's got a really good thread out um, today suggesting that they were starting to see a real shift to Trump by this time um, and, and by September and uh, in comparison with Clinton in 2016. But that this time Whoa. Biden is just way out ahead on those suburban districts. And that's, that's encouraging. And I guess to get back to the, before we jump into like how, what the outcome is, if we can just, I'd like to just talk a little bit with you about, you know, like your thoughts on, um, and share some thoughts of my own about what the, the impact of this kind of um, symbolism mm -hmm. that, you know, what was it, 31 million people watched last night? No, tw 20, 21 point six. 21, 21 million people which watched is, last which night. Is, which is down 10 million from his, from his. Um, down 10, mil 10 million from last and from under Biden, under the Democratic National Committee. By that, 2 million. Yeah. 2 million. And yet that's still a lot of people watching it. And, and, and the, the ongoing impact of sort of the moving moving the line of removing boundaries, putting out a kind of um, imagery and rhetoric that we really haven't heard before in America, mm -hmm. that does have echoes of authoritarianism, of even Nazism, and you know why are they doing this? And we know, it, and the other aspect being just the incredible amount of propaganda that we heard over the last four days at the RNC, where it, we really were in a situation where there was absolutely no concern for the truth, where they were trying to reframe the last, you know, a, a problem, problems that Trump mm -hmm. has created. Mm -hmm. that like like the violence we see happening like mm -hmm. racism mm -hmm. like he that there was a reframing of that as as joe biden's problem like all of a sudden joe biden has been responsible for everything mm -hmm. and you know just from trump being friendly to china which we know has been happening mm -hmm. to you know but he was saying biden biden is the one biden has just been cozying up to china you know, well, the Democrats are responsible for the unrest. And, and, but again, look at, in a way, how um, reactive and desperate that kind of framing is. That is really depending on the events that we were seeing in Kenosha, the violence that has been happening there, which was not that different from the violence that happened immediately after um, uh, the George Floyd um, killing and the Black Lives Matter. And initially there was strong reaction, crowd reaction, and then it gelled into a very organized and, um, uh, and solid protest movement around Black Lives Matter. And I think we're going to see that again, but trying to pin this violence on Biden that's a that's a momentary that's that's oh that's this week's news well how is that going to play out as we start to see the nba has um has canceled games all of the sports even <clears throat> now the the nhl major league ball uh, all the sports leagues we're going to see the nfl in here we're starting to see the the public responded um positively once the violence subsided and it became more a protest movement, the public has been very much on the side of, of this as opposed to Trump. So I feel like this pinning this whole business, oh, the cities are burning and there's all violence, these are all the Democrats, this is what the Democrats want for, want for America is to, is to bring everything down. I feel like that's a reactive and defensive move that is really the result of they don't have anything that they can pin on Biden. But again, let's get back to, well, what is really going on in America right now? And it's about COVID. How many people are home away from work, suffering, needing, needing their employment, needing some kind of assistance from the government? And what is so shocking 
as a Canadian, and I think most people from everywhere else um, um, in developed economies looking at the United States are shocked to discover, to even imagine that Americans who lose their job are also losing health insurance. I mean, that is just, that is an unthinkable outcome. And what I think is going to, what the dynamic that I don't think people are really talking about is that Trump is again pushing, let's open everything up, open everything up. Well, yesterday, the United States had 1,125 COVID deaths. Canada I... had eight. And these are the kinds of numbers that Europe is, is, is getting, Asia is getting, America is absolutely out of control. Not only is it out of control, but this pressure to reopen and now to send children back to school. We're struggling with this here in Canada, where we had eight deaths across Canada, the entire country, um, in, yesterday. And we're struggling with how are we going to reopen our schools safely. We're, the United States is so far beyond getting any kind of control for this. Uh, and I think that we're going to see, we're going to start to see rising rates again, that second wave, which never, the first wave never really subsided in the United States. Now it's going to come back with a vengeance and there are going to be children getting this and there will be children dying of COVID by election day. And I think that the complete tone deafness by this administration, this president, you know, it's one thing to talk about the people who have died in the past. There will be so many more. And where was that? They don't have an answer. And Americans are not going to forget that. No. No. It's just, it's just, it's in, incomprehensible to me that Americans are just going to, oh, well, you know, they're going to remember that crowd without masks at the White House in the middle of a pandemic just last shocking. night. Um, and so I just, you know, that, that base is always going to be with him, but, but there's just such a failure of response. Um, a couple of comments have, you know, on, in our chat, people are saying, you know, the, the problem is we don't want to get too comfy with the polling that's going on now with mm -hmm. Biden's lead. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, again, I, you know, the, I, I look at the national polls largely to get a sense of voter sentiment overall. To me, the most important indicator is how did the polls compare in 2018 with the actual mm -hmm. results? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they, were, they were pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. The real question is what is happening in the swing states? And still in the swing states, mm -hmm. Biden is ahead. And you look at a state like Florida. Well, how are all those elderly people in Florida going, right. you know, and, and he's, and Biden is polling with the, for the first time in quite a long time, Biden is polling well with the elderly in lots of these swing states. So uh, we've got a long way to go. This was a moment for Trump to kind of turn a page or to define Biden. The reality is this is about swing voters in swing states in about 25 counties yeah and what are they what are they going to do as we get closer and and right. i think it's just too hard to read the tea leaves now because there will be a lot of events but when people talk about um oh the october surprise there's going to be something well if you're looking at joe biden and donald trump uh both of whom have really really well established brands uh at which candidate do you think is more likely to suffer an October surprise that's going to affect their numbers? I don't think it's going to be Biden. I mean, they will try things, but nothing they've tried so far has stuck. And if they thought they had it, we would have seen it by now. There's one last thing that I want to talk about before we turn to the questions. We have some really great questions and some really great comments coming in in the chat room. Um, chat box. So today in the New York Times, there was an article about how the silent majority on Facebook and how what people may not realize is what's going on over there. 
And in the last election, what went on on Facebook and on social media turned the election. And it took us all by surprise. <coughs> so what do you think the dangers and risks are there? Well, this one is a, is a hard one. We're seeing, you know, the emergence of QAnon, um, which has really been coming on in a big way. Um, that one is really hard to get a sense of, but I also feel like Facebook can, can, can be um, a little bit illusory because I think that if you look at, well, what are the, what are the biggest pages and biggest postings on Facebook around the election every day? Yeah. It's all extreme hard right. But when you look at TV ratings, which is where likely voters hang out, you know, even still today, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, these are where most voters are still, they're still being influenced by what they see on Facebook. But, but the hard right is not owning um, the audience in the same way that it does on Facebook. So I wonder how much those Facebook results are being um, jiggered by and manipulated to make it appear that there's this huge audience. Because the polling, once again, over and over and over again, the pollsters are going out into the community and talking to likely voters, and they are not seeing the kind of results that Facebook is indicating. But I'm very concerned by Facebook's um, inaction here. You know, we, this, this Kenosha shooter, this 20, this 17-year-old uh, boy um, uh, who, who murdered two people and, and injured someone else, and he was part of um, uh, th this militia group, which was very clearly a danger. And the FBI has pointed to the alt-right and domestic terrorism from the right as being um, the, the biggest danger, domestic threat facing Americans today from terrorism. And, and we're seeing Zippo from Facebook, except for cosmetic, oh, well, we're concerned and we'll take down some pages and some of the QAnon has come down. They have to do much more. And as Tim Ellis just commented, um, Ben Shapiro gets more views than every network combined. But does he? Because when you look at the polling, it, that's not borne out by the polling. That's not, you know, if you went out and you asked people, so this is where I'm suspicious about these view numbers. I, I, don't, mess, I don't necessarily <laughs> believe them because they've been manipulated before to make it appear that these people are way more influential. Go out and, and talk to people and ask how many of them know who Ben Shapiro is. I don't think right. you, I don't think you right. see that. you know, one Views of the don't things, necessarily actually, correlate to votes as uh, Tim no. is also commenting. Um, there's some great commentary going on in the chat. I wish I could bring it all in. Um, anyway, I think we should turn to the questions because there's some great questions as well. Some of can you guys take, who- Can we just take a couple of minutes to talk about how Canadians would see this election? That's the first question. Yeah. How can Canada, Canadians protect ourselves from our two largest and most unreliable trading partners, America and China? Mm. Mm. Well, I, you know, I think that China is not as large a trading partner as it as um, we often think that it is. It's a larger trading partner for the United States, but we definitely have to be um, very concerned. I'm more concerned about China's um, influences uh, around the world um, on any kind of dissidence and, and controlling, controlling messages. Uh, but we do have to be concerned. Our foreign policy has to, um, has to step up. But one of the things that really concerns me about the, the um, uh, alarm about China is that I think that we've minimized the alarm we should be experiencing about the United States. And I look, for instance, at um, our refugee and immigration policy, where recently the United States was held by the um, Canadian federal court to be not a safe third country. It's entirely possible, entirely conceivable that we're going to start to see um, refugees coming from the United States, actually from the United States, not transiting through the United States, but political refugees who are seeking asylum 
from persecution in the United States. And I, and I don't think that, I think that we have tended to normalize in the same way as the American media often does, um, normalize what's going on in the United States without recognizing the very real, the very real impact. But I do want to say a couple of things just as an observer. You know, you've talked about God and religion in, in the U.S. elections. I mean, this is just like, it's beyond Canadians. Like all of the, and this hand on the heart and all oh, you have to have your lapel pin and the stars and bars and, and the military, the sanctification of the military, military heroes, um, as, if, as if the United States does not exploit populations of poor um, and vulnerable Americans to get them into the military and then, you know, and, and then ex exploit them. Um, and, and, and then there's this kind of all this razzmatazz about the military when it's really about defense contracts, massive, massive mm -hmm. defense contracts. Um, and then science. Uh, you know, Canadians are just like, we would be in shock. And again, I point to our COVID numbers and the fact that sick, just Pew Research polls yesterday came out with, with numbers that 66% of Canadians um, strongly support um, the Canadian government's approach to COVID compared to the politicization, that, which is unthinkable and has cost God knows how many thousands or tens of thousands of lives in the United States. This, this business about the masks and politicizing masks and politicizing any response, all of this is just so foreign to not just Canadians, but I think most of the developed world. And I don't know that Americans really understand the degree to which their national reputation is just collapsing under this administration. And we saw this under George Bush, it recovered under Barack Obama, but the world does not see these issues the way that Americans do. And we're just, we're always kind of stunned by this American exceptionalism, like, America is the greatest country in the world. It's like, hello? This is, it's just, it's odd. Anyway, to our questions. Um, well, I just want to um, respond to that and just say that, you know, the thing about America is that it's so vast. There are so many people in America who know that America's in yes. bad, you know, that this is really bad and agree with the rest of the world. You know, I would say, mm. I would still say the vast majority of Americans fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And the sad part is that this country's been hijacked mm -hmm. by a minority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, we've seen that happen in Canada too. Mm -hmm. So just to a shout out for all the Americans that are going to work really, really hard in this election. And um, to the 100,000 Americans in Vancouver who hopefully are all going to vote. And across Canada, I think somebody said there may be a, well, a million internationally. And, you know, probably a lot of them are in, a lot are in Canada. So, mm -hmm. yes, votefromabroad.org. Everybody should be ordering their um, ballots now and voting early. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question comes from our managing editor, Lori Few. What are the biggest risks to democracy or rule of law that you think we need to watch for through the next three weeks of the campaign until November 3rd? That's, that's really fascinating is that, are we concerned about, um, there are sort of, there are two windows here. There's the post election. I mean, what everybody is concentrating on is number one, getting to election day and can Joe Biden win? Um, and then if he wins, can he actually get to put his hand on that Bible and take the oath and be inaugurated without um, Donald Trump setting everything loose? I think those are very real questions. But I'll tell you what my biggest concern is. I want to see Ruth Bader Ginsburg make it to January 20th, 2021. That everything hangs on that because if the if the even if the democrats can take the senate they can control they can control judicial appointments and and everything depends on that 
That's so true. And that's so big. And the only ray of hope I see in that is that the court has come out lately with some more moderate kinds of decisions. And, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. that the court would just say yeah. enough yeah. of this. But, you know, we can't count on that. Um, but if he Al, gets a, if he gets another appointment, he can yeah. he can overrule them. Yeah, and don't That's think true. he won't demand loyalty. Right. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Uh, when Al Lehman is asking, when Paul Thoreau wrote his travel book, The Deep South, he observed that the two most popular social events throughout the South were church and gun shows. Given that these are the institutions most important to majorities in the South, how can Trump opponents pull some of this appeal away from him? Well, I don't know that they can. I think that everything, again, depends on the center. And if you look at where the polling is going, suburban women are just, they've had it with all of this. And yes, the gun shows are very, are very popular. I don't know that they're that popular with suburban moms whose kids are going to school and having to go through active shooter drills. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, even today, even despite the, the uh, popularity of gun shows, most Americans regularly poll in support of regulating, regulating um, weapons. Uh, certainly the assault weapons ban was very effective and it was supported. Right. And I'm um, coming from that area myself, I would just say that, again, even in the South, there are a lot of amazing Democrats, progressives. The South used to be democratic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it seems far, far, far from that now, but things can turn. Mm -hmm. Sally Ann Mount Mowat is asking, where do you think that somewhat secretive Christian corporate, very right-wing group working to install like-minded leaders internationally, Harper is involved, are involved in this scenario? I think she's referring to the group that Netflix did a series on mm -hmm. about the Washington-based mm -hmm. What's the, what is it Christian closely? group. Is I, it the I keep family thinking, or the... You, well, there's also the, is it the UDI, the... Uh, United Democratic Institute or something like that, which is, which is Republican, you know, but there may be something that's... Uh, maybe Jenny, who's Googling for us and handling the chat, could Google that. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're very influential. They are the very... The fellowship. Thank you, Tim. The right. fellowship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I... I'm always astonished at how strong in the United States these these um, movements are, and they they just don't have that same kind of purchase in Canada. So this is not something that we really um, necessarily uh, necessarily feel. And but again, you keep what I think what's happening in the United States is the hardening of the division and the polarization. I don't know that those groups are really expanding their influence so mm -hmm. much as um, pulling in the base and mm -hmm. activating them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but yeah. but the Democrats have I think in this in this. Um, uh, in this period, since 2018, the Democrats have become extremely active in those House races and those district races that are going to be able to take back some of these gerrymandered um, districts and reassert uh, a more democratic uh, position in, um, uh, in, in the state houses that is going, to, hopefully, but I think that that's where their focus has been. Um, and then I think something that is going to be a live and growing issue for Americans over the next uh, years is um, how undemocratic the Senate is, the Electoral College and the Senate, where you have vast, where the rural um, and small states vastly outweigh the much larger urban states, which are not only much larger, rep more representative of the wider um, uh, diversity of American and American opinion, but are also the big economic engines. I mean, it's no surprise to me that Kentucky, where Mitch McConnell comes from, is a have-not state, it, and yet it controls so much 
and it has the same number of senators as New York State and California. And this, and this, um, uh, this imbalance, I think this is going to, unless this is resolved in some way, this is going to become a severe breaking point. We saw, a rec we saw an indication of that um, at John Lewis's service where Barack Obama called for the end of um, the filibuster in the U.S. Senate, but I think more has to happen. Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. need to get some kind of state status to balance out um, that result. Yeah, they're really, the Republicans are really afraid of that idea. But, um, you know, people are joking. I hear a lot of people talking now and joking about the idea of New York and California and um, Oregon and Washington. Washington. <laughs> yeah, coming on, come on into Canada. Let's, let's yeah, have. Or, <laughs> well, I don't know how much, we, how much would Canada, I mean, who wants to really, when you look at the balance of the population, it wouldn't exactly be that they join Canada, it would more be a merger, and how many Canadians would really want to join in a merger with, uh, we, we might go for like a, a NAFTA type agreement with those states, but. Um, yeah, but all they of these seem people, a lot more aligned. You know, we, we definitely are become they're becoming more, you know, aligned to Canada than the rest of the well it's so um, interesting that, that North America culturally aligns vertically, north south, yeah, not east yeah. west. So you yeah. see this you see similar similar cultural patterns right down the west coast of Canada, yeah. in the prairie and the and yeah. the um, Midwest and then yeah. on the east coast. Yeah. Um to the point of the threat to Canada and of the rhetoric of the propaganda of the moving boundaries and norms, we have a comment in the chat basically saying, I don't agree that this is not a threat in Canada. And I happen to agree with that comment. I think it is a threat in Canada too. I think it, you know, it has affected the whole world that Trump has done this over and over and over again. Um, but what are your thoughts on that, Sandy? Well, I think that there are a lot of people who want it to be a threat. Um, but look at, in Canada, Aaron O'Toole just took over the reins of the, of the Conservative Party. And after playing to the base, he instantly pivoted in a heartbeat, pivoted directly to the center and started talking about LGBTQ, where she had refused to go to the Pride, um, to a Pride event. Uh, Pride events uh, while he was um, while he was running for the leadership of the Conservative Party, um, and and then we saw um, what was it the PP what there was a very hard right and you moderated an event during the Canadian federal election, which had um, one of these candidates who did quite well actually in her riding in British Columbia, which was quite surprising. Um, but I'm going to say, I'm still going to say no. And the reason why I'm going to say no is that I think that there is a ceiling in Canada for um, religious rhetoric and the religious right. I just, they, in Canada, they may be able to um, uh, gain purchase and gain political power uh, in some kind of strange way by um, leveraging different alliances. Remember, we have many different parties. Uh, we have the Bloc Québécois, we have the Green Party, we have the NDP, the Liberals, and the Conservatives as, as major parties in Canada. So it, there isn't the same ability. All the other parties would straight, straight up gang up on the religious right. Um, right, Especially right. Quebec. Especially yeah. Quebec. And, and Stephen Harper knew this, and that's why he, he told everybody, forget about yeah. ever, ever, talking about abortion in Canada. And that was, that was the most right-wing leader that we've had in decades and we, in Canada. And we, here we were hearing like, you know, pro-life rhetoric in the last four days that was the most blatant, you know, the most blatant I've ever heard embraced by, uh, you know, one of the two parties. So things are really changing in the United States. Danny Oakes had a really interesting comment over here, which is, you know, that it's really important to remember that in the United States, Citizens United, um, you know, there's, there's things rolling back Citizens United, elimination of the Electoral College, election reform could go a long way in fixing what's wrong in the U.S. And, you know, right on to that, that's so true. We, you know, the question is, will we ever, you know, when will we get 
a president, a Senate, and a Congress that can push that through. Like the, when that happens, mm -hmm. you know, that's a new day for America. Yeah. So let's hope it can. Jennifer Nathan is asking, if and when Trump disputes the election results, do you think the Democrats have a plan to pull the country out of chaos? Still crushed, they gave in. To, yeah, me too. <laughs> Still crushed, they gave in to Gore's results so easily. Yeah. Why did they cave on that? And I don't. I yeah. don't think. I don't think that they will cave um, no. um, this time. Uh, and remember. Uh, I, I think that what, what they're not really talking about too much, but it has been out there. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, if he, no matter what happens, if he loses this election, his term ends on January 20th, 2021. And if there isn't a new president sworn in on that day, someone else takes over the role of president, but it isn't, but tr Donald Trump doesn't get to extend his presidency the person who takes over control of the presidency um, in the interim until a new, a new president is sworn in is the leader of the House, Nancy Pelosi. So we could yet see a woman president <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> but, I do, but I do think, I think that they're probably biding their time. And you know, for all of the concern about the democratic strat strategizing, I think Nancy Pelosi has been one of the most savvy political operators I've ever seen and i don't think for a minute that she isn't like lying awake about this every night yeah agreed i think large teams of lawyers are already figuring it out i've got, I've got a question for jenny if you can google while we're talking um i've got a question about uh impeaching u.s supreme court judges whether there's the remotest possibility that we could see, for instance, Brett Kavanaugh be removed from the bench. When I was growing up, there were billboards all over the South that said, impeach Earl Warren. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess He was so. the civil rights, he was the, the civil rights Supreme Court justice. Yeah. So Danny uh, Ox, Danny Ox is asking, what is a larger long-term problem for Canada, the destruction of democratic norms and the rule of law natively in the US or the erosion of American soft power globally? That is a really good question. I wanna find that question because I wanna look at it and really say it again, It's in Linda. the Q and A, it's in the Q and A Yeah, box. I'm looking through that. I'm trying okay, to Okay, find... it's the top oh. one that says, what is a larger long-term problem for Canada? the destruction of democratic norms and the rule of law natively in the US or the erosion of American soft power globally? Well, I think they go together, um, but I would say the erosion of the US po soft power internationally, not just soft power. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that NATO is on life support right now and mm -hmm. it, could, it could crater, it could, it could just, collapse. We've got the WHO um, that we've been part of, and there's been so much, um, uh, it's such a, a concentrated attempt to discredit the WHO, which does incredible and amazing and important work, notwithstanding errors that it may have made at certain mm -hmm. moments over the, uh, this pandemic. Uh, all those international alliances, and Canada doesn't have, we're alone. Out, we're basically floating out there between the Atlantic and the Pacific. If, if we do not have United, the United States at our side, and Donald Trump is indicating in every single way that he can, he doesn't give a shit about Canada. So I look to things like uh, Putin and Arctic drilling and, his, and Putin's increasingly um, uh, aggressive tone around the Arctic and where are we going to be if we do not have those alliances we have to find them fast we have to find them with respect to China and the United States if if uh, if this election goes south and assuming this is a follow-up question from Danny assuming Trump wins and takes it again in January what does it mean for Canada's relationship with the US our trade policy and our borders assuming that COVID is still a problem? Well, I mean, this is the thing that I think, I feel like we are, remember how in January and February, we kind of um, 
uh, dithered while we were hearing all of this about, I did, uh, while we were hearing all this about the looming pandemic and it was coming, it was coming and we all needed to respond to it. I feel like we are in December or January in the economic pandemic that is going to hit. Because the United States, if, if Donald Trump is reelected, the United States is going to continue on this path until there's a vaccine that is not only widely available, but widely accepted and used and starts to really have an impact and allows them to reopen that economy. And because we are so dependent on that economy for our exports. I mean, I think that we have, we've been buffered along and insulated by extraordinarily effective government programs by the federal, provincial and municipal governments um, across Canada. But this can only last so long if the United States fails, as it is failing now to deal with the pandemic. I am really, really deeply concerned, more than anything, about where we are economically. I think, you know, somewhat to this point, Sandy, Tim Ellis has just made a comment. I think Canada's strongest asset in resisting fascism is that here the system largely works. People mostly get the support they need. I moved here eight years ago, and the difference between back home in the U.S. and here was profound for me as, at the time, a low-income person. And I, I yeah, really agree with that, Tim. It's, it's the difference between a working system and a broken system. That's really interesting. I'd be, I'd be interested to hear from Tim and from you, Linda, your observations about well, what, what were those differences because certainly we see the strains and stresses you and I are sitting here in Vancouver and we've got um, the downtown east side and we've got the opioid crisis which is just a, is is causing um, such devastation in our communities and 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 we do have poverty and we do have um, indigenous issues and racial issues so I wonder Linda would you talk a little bit about what you the contrast between Canada and the United States that you see the immediate thing that comes to mind is the scale of it Sandy you know like yes we have problems in Vancouver and yes Canada has problems but when I go back to New York you know there's potholes everywhere you know the airports are just like unbelievably run down um, nobody, you know, the healthcare situation is so scary, you know, it's, it's, it's just really so different. Like, you know, when I lived in the U.S., I had a pretty bad healthcare policy. It was very, very expensive because I was a freelancer. And to get any of it to, you know, get them to pay, I would have to sit on the phone for hours on these voicemail things. And all of it was set up to get you to not be able to access your healthcare. And although some people have really good private health care because they work for corporations, if you are not in the corporate world, you're really fucked. And I think that probably that goes, I could make that broad general statement about a lot of services and, you know, in mm -hmm. the U.S. So I think the privatization of everything in America yeah. has led to you know, a lot of deterioration from what I remember in the 70s and 80s and maybe my memories are glossed over somewhat but i wish we could hear tim well and he has responded he he said the obvious so tim has replied the obvious one is health care i broke my right. leg on both sides but only one took me five years to pay off but it's a lot more than that one of the biggest surprises when i first started coming to toronto was that everything worked the yes. infrastructure was functional you know and the, yes. uh, the i think this is yes. um Americans, I think, are really kind of numb, and, and the rest of us don't really know, but the, the degree to which the uh, defense industry, the military industrial complex, siphons off um, and mass incarceration, all of these, yeah. there, there, is, there is a corporate welfare system in the United States that is just absolutely staggering in its scope and scale and we don't and it's very invisible we don't really see it mm -hmm. and, I, and i do want to say one thing about um the issue around poverty so in the last couple of years i had to do i was dealing with something with my son in los angeles and i had to go into a western union in downtown los angeles which was which was skid road 
And my son spends a lot of time in the United States. He lives there and he travels there a lot. And he travels especially over what we call flyover country. And anybody who follows Sarah Ken Kenzier knows wh what I'm talking about, the St. Louis and, 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 and all of the, the middle of the continent. Um, and I remember being in that Western Union in downtown Los Angeles and just being staggered at the just the terrible, shocking need of everybody in the lineup and mm -hmm. everybody around there. And I was mm -hmm. commenting on it to my son who said, this is everywhere in the United States and mm -hmm. it goes mm -hmm. for miles and miles mm -hmm. and miles. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Canada, it might be in certain pockets or it might be in certain regions, but it just goes. Okay, Heidi has made a really good and important comment bringing to our attention that rural Canada is not like the cities. Also, not everyone gets what they need from the system, particularly if you were BIPOC. Also, where's the acknowledgement of First Nations experience within a system that was designed to oppress mm -hmm. them? And if mm -hmm. I may, I'd like to respond. Thank you so much for that. Um, absolutely. In America, I, my experience was that Indigenous people, Native Americans, were largely just invisible. Like, I'm not going to compare and say, who am I? I can't say that, that First Nations experience in Canada is better, or there's been more, you know, more justice, but I just... I really feel like at least in Canada, First Nations experience to me since I've been here has been a lot more visible and First Nations voices have been a lot more present than American, you know, first than Native American voices were in America. Now, I'd love to hear from other people on that, but I do appreciate that you know, in Canada, there are many situations of, with First Nations that are absolutely horrible and untenable and, and baffling, like how a country like Canada could have a part of the population that doesn't have good drinking water. That's just that, that I, I still can't understand how that's allowed to go on. And, um, and, and more than, and more than um, drinking water, I mean, I, th I think that, that, um, that land rights, I mean, the very fact that we are spending all of this time, and, and I'm guilty of this too, um, concerned about resource management. Well, where the hell did these resources come from? You know, these billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of resources, the oil that gets exported around the world, or gets exported to the United States, forestry, fisheries, all of these sorts of things. And these are just sort of taken as given. And then, and then the rest of the country just kind of like, oh, isn't it too bad about the indigenous people? I mean, yeah. it's just I, the, the lack of, but I, I'm, but and in maybe, America, that's just like, it's like the thing with slavery in America. You know, like there's been no reparations. There's been mm -hmm. no real official apology. Well, and, and, I, and I that's also... part of the whole thing. The debate going on right now, you know, Trump is basically saying we're proud of our history. And what he means by yeah. that is we're not going to do cancel. We're not going to cancel our pride of that part of our history. And that that's shocking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that I think is really interesting, even around the issue um, of Black Lives Matter, the the oppression, white supremacy is um, has been, and and it is a foundation of Canadian culture. I I don't know how I feel like the conversation is changing around Indigenous issues in Canada, whether the results will change, what will happen. Um, you know, there will always be resistance whenever anybody wants to change anything. Um, but I do feel like that conversation is changing. And I think we're certainly mm -hmm. seeing it around the issue around the pipelines and even just mm -hmm. how that was dealt with um, in January and February. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to move on to a new question. We could have a whole yes, we um, could segment on that, and we probably should. Adrian Drobnis 
it asks, maybe no October surprise, but what about foreign, i.e. Russian manipulation and interference in the election, right? Either through social media or more direct disruption in the election process. I'm more concerned about the, about the um, ballot manipulation than social media. I, I feel like there's a kind of, um, and this might be, I'm, I'm such a Pollyanna, but I feel like there's a certain degree of resistance. Having said that, I'm watching QAnon and what's happening there. And to me, there's no question, but that the Russians are involved in that in mm. some way. And whatever Roger Stone is up to, interesting how he got freed in time for them to be active during this campaign. Um, uh, well, I'm more concerned about actual hacking of the ballot boxes and I think that that's a that's one of the tells behind the incredible manipulation and disruption of the U.S. Postal Service because I think that Trump is most concerned that actual paper ballots are not hackable um, <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm Wait, anxious. What about an eraser? <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm 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 concerned about it and I think there's every reason yeah to be very concerned be. about it. Um, should be, and, and how about, okay, so we have a lot more questions, so I'm gonna try to push through some of these. Karthik B asks, for fuck's sake indeed, but I think it was masterfully planned and executed. It's very effective messaging to undecided segments of the voter base. What lessons in campaigning during COVID do you think Canadian politicians will adopt? Hmm, what do you think, Linda? <laughs> I think they do watch, and I think mm -hmm. that uh, I think that they will look very. I think that Republican um, political operatives advise Canadian. Well, probably on both sides, Democratic and Republicans advise Canadian campaigns, and I think they'll look to see which talking points worked. Well, so here's here's one of the things that I think is very different between Canada and the United States. And I alluded to this earlier with the Pew mm -hmm. Research poll that came out that mm -hmm. showed really, really strong and widespread Canadian mm -hmm. support for the government approach to COVID. I don't mm -hmm. think that the same kind of politicization about no. um, uh, politicizing science, politicizing um, masks, politicizing any of the um, mitigation measures. I don't see that that's a, that's a starter at all. Where I think that the uh, conservatives, where I see them uh, perhaps even uh, lying low and waiting in the weeds, uh, I think they, the weed controversy um, uh, was a was a foretaste of what's to come. The Canadian government has had to put push out into the economy hundreds of billions of dollars, and they had to do that extremely quickly and without the top kinds of due diligence that we would normally mm -hmm. expect to see. And we are going to see more cases like the WE case. They're just, it's just inevitable that there are going to be organizations that receive money and and the and that interests whether it's the NDP or the conservatives are going to be able to say see see the, you know mm -hmm. somebody got somebody got something that they didn't deserve because mm -hmm. they were a friend of the government and I think that that's that's a vulnerability but I don't see that that's actually something that the that we're getting from the United States. The United States is still largely on this anti-science thing. I mean, imagine that changing the CDC rules while Dr. Fauci is under general anesthetic, getting, a, getting an operation. It's like, what? <laughs> we're at the end of our hour. And, but before we go, I just wanna, um, I just want to talk about the possibility of a blue wave sweeping across America, sweeping out Trump, sweeping out the Republicans from the Senate, putting more good science-based, fact-based people in place. I'm curious what you think the chances of that are, Sandy. I think, I don't think they look good right now. What do you think? I think they do look good if there isn't interference. That's what I'm most concerned about is the interference. Um, uh, right now, uh, I mean, this is an incredibly stable race. If you look at, just the other day, I looked back at the, at the uh, polling results through the campaign and compared the Clinton-Trump 
um, campaign, the 2016 campaign with the 2020. And it's like, it's incredibly stable because Trump is, an, is a deeply unpopular leader and Biden is not deeply unpopular. Biden has net favorability. Um, I think that is a chicken that's going to come home to roost. I think 2018 is a better indicator than 2016 if there's no interference and there's a very good possibility of the of Democrats recapturing the Senate. And if that happens, then, then all, all bets are off. But a lot has to happen between now in late August and November 3rd. And the, to me, the biggest issue is what's the interference going to be to prevent that? Thank you, Sandy. And to me, the second biggest issue is the number of people who will actually get out and vote. Mm -hmm. If everybody gets out and votes that can vote, yeah. I see the blue wave can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was there in the primaries. Remember, during COVID, Georgia and New York had primaries right in the midst of it, and they had massive Democratic turnout, massive, in Georgia, which is a... It, so. And maybe that's what we're going to see. Maybe yeah. that's what we're going to see. And one last comment from Tim Ellis. Votefromabroad.org. Go, go, go. Yep. Thank you, everybody. It's been great having you on the call. Thanks for coming to our pop-up conversation. If you're not subscribed to National Observer, please subscribe. And we'll see you in September when we have a great lineup coming. We have Amy Goodman from, Amy Goodman from Democracy Now!, we have the former head of CSIS, Dick Fadden, to talk about disinformation. And we have Jagmeet Singh coming. And another, Vandana Shiva, the seed activist from India. And we're so excited about the other people who haven't confirmed yet, but who probably will come. So hope everybody is well. Stay safe. See you next time. Nice to see everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.